John. Uh, this works? Sure. All right, good. We got one. Um, there we go, that's good. Now, I have even a, a poorer memory than some that have gone before me, so I work on <coughs> the script here, even though I've given this probably a half dozen, ten times, maybe, you know, I still don't remember it. But um, we're going to get by fine here. Um, there have been a lot of men and women down through our nation's history and our state's history as well. So I think it made amazing contributions, but have been all but, but ignored by the historical record. And I believe Dwayne L. Bliss is just such a man. Uh, those in this group at least know the name, most of you probably do, but outside of this group, I found out when I had written the book and was making presentations, nobody had any idea who he was. Um, but just how forgotten was he perhaps in Nevada? Well, there was a book about the Bliss family published in 1992, but the very brief portion of it that had to do with Dwayne Bliss was, I'm, I'm sorry to say, totally inaccurate. I'm not casting any stones because it's a lot harder, was a lot harder to do research back in those days than it is today when we have the internet and everything else. Um, but regardless, it doesn't change the fact that we, that we really still knew very little about Dwayne L. Bliss before my book, I believe. So, why is he worth remembering? Well, Bliss had a number of different careers in his lifetime in the West, and four of them made, made, made him a pioneer, really. Those uh, careers were in mining, railroading, lumbering, and tourism. I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of these careers and how they all dovetail together. Uh, but a word here, I wrote this presentation for groups who mo know mo much, much less about Bliss and much less about the Comstock than this group here does. I've tried to change a lot of parts of it to, to, to better reflect your interests and your knowledge here, but if some of it still comes along and you know comes off as, as uh, pretty simple for, for what you folks know, uh, please excuse that because as I say, uh, most of the folks who have heard this really didn't even know there was a Comstock load, so that's where we'll start. Uh, in in D and T history, Bliss was certainly one of the lesser known figures um, in that history. Uh, thus, after reading my Bliss biography, uh, my friend Stephen Drew, Steve, where are you, Stephen? He's up there. He is still, huh? He felt that the crowd would be interested in learning more about Bliss, and particularly about his V&T activities um, and his unknown contributions to the Comstock. So that's why we're here. So, Stephen, thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Okay. There have been a lot of excellent books about the Comstock written. Uh, one of my favorite, one of the ones that helped me the most, was Ron James' book, uh, The Roar and the Silence. Some of the earlier ones were, were outstanding uh, as well, but uh, I think of the modern versions, I, I think Ron did a fantastic job. Um, he's probably the foremost scholar about the Comstock today, and he believed that Bliss's story was worth telling too, and so he wrote the foreword to my book, for which I thank him. Oh, uh, right. right. Right, right, yeah, oh, there we go. Well, same guy, no color, how about that? Okay. <laughs> this is Dwayne L. Bliss as a young man of about 30 years old from the earliest days of photography in the early 1860s. Um, you probably recognize the name certainly from their v &T activities, but also perhaps for D.L. Bliss State Park on the western shore of Lake Tahoe. Uh, and I'm sure most of you, you know, do know something about his, his, uh, his V&T days. Now, I think he's a handsome looking fellow. Uh, he reminds me a little bit of Errol Flynn. And if some of you are really, really old, he even looks a little like Gilbert Rowland. But I'm not so sure there's anyone 
in this group. I think Gilbert Rowan was probably right after that railroad, uh, that robbery film we saw. Uh, Bliss was born in the Berkshire Hill, Hills of Massachusetts in 1883. In 1850, at only 17 years old, he was bitten by the gold bug, as so many other young men all around the world were. And um, he followed the Panama route to the California gold fields. He arrived in San Francisco in January 1851 as just one of thousand, thousands and thousands of hopeful 49ers. Now here's San Francisco just about the time Bliss arrived in 1851. It was only a few years before this, of course, that it was known as Yerba Buena, um, which is good herb, good herb, and I, I don't understand why he picked that for a city, but that's what it, that's what it meant. Um, now, Bliss's first career actually happened while he was in California, where he would work for about a decade. During his first California years, he was an unsuccessful gold miner. Uh, we see a typical gold rush placer miner here working in a stream bed, and we can imagine this fellow as Dwayne Bliss, perhaps. Now, he didn't make any money as a 49er. He was like most of the thousands and thousands of others. Uh, but he gained a lot of practical mining experience, which would serve him for the rest of his career. What we're seeing here is placer mining, and of course it's a two-step operation, the mining and, and, and the milling. And I go into more of that with some of these other folks who don't know too much about it, but we'll skip that here. After a couple of unsuccessful years of this work, um, Bliss took a job as a clerk in a mercantile in Woodside on the San Francisco Peninsula. Uh, if any of you have been to Woodside recently, there is a museum there on the main road through town that is the same store that Dwayne Bliss worked in back in the 1860s. Uh, same store is there. It's a state museum. It's a wonderful little place, uh, you know, particularly if you were studying Bliss as I was at the time, and, it, and it's still there. Uh, well, these would be difficult years for Bliss. Uh, he married a young lady young Irish lady he met while he was there, and they ended up having two children. Uh, but in sight of uh, three years, Bliss's entire family, his wife, both children, died of various diseases. Uh, and it was perhaps for a new beginning that Bliss decided to uh, head to Washoe in, in, um, in Utah Territory and the Comstock in the early uh, 1860 just a year after the huge silver strike began. So while gold rush was placer mining, as you know, where the majority of the precious metal could be dug up out of the stream beds and everything, when the miners got over here, they found out it was a, it was a whale of a lot different situation. Um, deep, deep rock or underground mining, uh, gee, the Comstock mines went as what, deep as 3,200 feet perhaps or something like that. And it took a tremendous amount of money to mine over here. Uh, the truth is, though, that the mining over here was more than just finding the ore. Of course, after that, it had to, it had to be milled. And that was a completely separate operation over here. In this, early, in this 1865 photo, we see a number of these quartz mills, as they were called, on Sun Mountain. Uh, now, eventually, of course, they'd all moved down uh, to Carson River, uh, where water power would drive the mills. But we still have the two separate operations as, as they did in California, milling and, and mining. Um, but there was a third operation that was also vital to the success of the Comstock that you very seldom read about. I found very little in reading all of the books that I read about the Comstock of the place of this third industry, and that industry was lumbering. It was essential that a you know, a forest full of giant trees, unfortunately, came out of the Lake Tahoe basis uh, to support it, but it was necessary if the Comstock was to move on. So extracting silver and gold from the Comstock 
uh, three separate industries. It was kind of like a three-legged stool. We had mining, milling, and lumbering. And like a three-legged stool, you take any one of them out, and the stool's going to fail. And that's part of what my book is about, and how Bliss came to be the majority owner of the largest of the lumber empires that supported the Comstock. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. But, um, when Bliss first arrived on the Comstock, he established himself in Gold Hill. Uh, here we see Gold Hill in 1860 when Bliss first arrived. Now this drawing, and I'm sure a lot of you have read these books, but this drawing is from wandering journalist and author um, J. Ross Brown, who just did a wonderful job of, of covering the very, very early years of the Comstock, and his artwork is, is so fabulous, I think. There wasn't much in Gold Hill at the time, but of course there is there's one saloon, as we, whoops, nope, that's, that's not a saloon, is it? Okay, which way are we going? There we go. There's that little light. So, we have one saloon there. Uh, I'll get the hang of this thing right about it. I hate this digital stuff, I really do. Um, anyway, here, here's how J. Ross Brown portrayed neighboring Virginia City in, in 1860. Um, doesn't look like much there, you know, for a city that occupied 25,000 people sooner or later. Um, for nonfiction writers like I am, uh, you know, I discovered I have a challenge. Unlike writing novels, you have to be able to hold the reader's interest. And one of the ways I've discovered in, in, in writing nine nonfiction books is that rather than trying to describe a place or a thing myself, something that might have happened 100 or 200 or 250 years ago, my first book was written around the colonial area, so we're, we're talking about, you know, about 400 or 350 years ago. But rather than using my own words, I try to use the words of those who were writing in the day. Because I think by using their words, their vernacular, it helps the reader to put himself into the place and into the time. So I found that's a real effective tool. Um, So I want to read now what J. Ross Brown had to say about these uh, Virginia City and Gold Hill settlements that we saw in the early 1960s. And I hope this gives you a feel for the, for the time and place that I could not have given you. Quoting now from J. Ross Brown about all of the people who had come so quickly in this time frame. Quote, Framed shanties pitched together as if, as if by accident. Tents of canvas, of blankets, of brush, of potato sacks and old shirts, with empty whiskey barrels for chimneys. Smoky hovels of stone and mud. Coyote holes in the mountainside, forcibly seized by men. Pits and shafts with smoke issuing from every crevice. The intervals of space, which may or may not have been streets, were dotted over with human beings of such sort and variety and numbers that the fam uh, famous anthills of Africa were as if nothing in comparison. To say they were rough, muddy, unkempt, and unwashed would be uh, fairly expressive of their actual appearance. Here and there, to be sure, a San Francisco dandy of the boiled shirt and stovepipe pattern loomed up in proud consciousness of the triumphs of art under adverse circumstances, but they were merely peacocks in the barnyard." End of quote. Now, I could never have written something like that, you know, but I think that really describes what was going on there at the time and the place. Well. Dwayne Bliss spent the next eight years working and learning all parts of the silver mining business. He helped build and then managed and eventually partially owned the very first quartz mill on the Comstock before they all moved down the river to Carson, to, to Carson River. 
Eventually, after he had become a partner in the mill, he then became a partner in a small Comstock bank in Gold Hill, which supplied some of the massive funds that were required to do this deep rock mining and milling. He was also on the board of directors of a couple of the Comstock mines, so he really kept his hand in all, all phases of the operation there. He also took some time to go back home to Massachusetts, where he met a lady who would become his second wife. Um, one of my book's chapters is, uh, is devoted to the story of the women on the Comstock. Um, Ron James and his wife, who I mentioned earlier, wrote a complete book on the women of the Comstock. You know, and mine certainly isn't that thorough, but it does talk about, you know, the life and times of the women who were living on the Comstock. So over the next few decades, Duane and Elizabeth Bliss would have four sons and a daughter. Now, this slide is dated 1864, but that's dead wrong by about 40 years. Um, this is probably Duane and Elizabeth Bliss uh, later in their lives, I'm guessing probably around the 1890s somewhere. Now, we need to put Duane Bliss aside for a moment and talk about the milieu where all of these things were happening uh, and how the Comstock had changed in the eight years while Bliss was climbing the business ladder. Um, all of this in my, is in my book because it's important, particularly for people who don't know so much about the Comstock, to really get a primer on what's going on there and what this was all about and everything. <laughs> Okay, here we see Virginia City in 1866. Uh, it's a little fuzzy, I think, the photo, but you can see that it's grown a, a lot in the seven years since uh, the earlier drawing we saw. But how had it changed? Well, in 1860, the earliest mines and mills in the Comstock had been built by men with a dream, uh, just like the 49ers in California. As a matter of fact, many of them had come over here and found out quickly that they couldn't make money here any more than they could make it in California. Um, so some of the men who grew on the Comstock um, uh, did get rich, but most, of course, did not. The rich were far, far fewer. Uh, and what these early miners discovered was that it was just enormously expensive to work on the Comstock. Now, prior to the 1860s, most commercial ventures were conducted by sole proprietors or partnerships. But the costs associated with mining on the Comstock were so big, so immense, that they required a new financial tool. Uh, that tool was incorporation. Now, incorporation had been around for quite a few years, but it had been rarely used in the past. Uh, this allowed companies, of course, to accumulate capital by selling stock to the public. Well, did it work? Uh, Western historian David Lavender wrote, more than 4, 000, wrote that more than 4,000 corporations followed the year after corporation was, uh, incorporation was discovered on the Comstock, and three quarters of those were for mining companies. That, in a nutshell, of course, is what happened on the Comstock. The small miners, the entrepreneurs that come here with big dreams were forced out. Uh, and as you all know, on the Comstock, one corporation had risen above all the others uh, in the 1860s and, and had by this time really formed an iron monopoly. That would be our good friends, the Bank of California. This is the bank's headquarters uh, on the far right, a San Francisco firm founded in 1864 by William Ralston. It was the first commercial bank in the West uh, and uh, thanks eventually to its Comstock monopoly, it would become the second richest bank in the entire union. And the bank and its money was, of course, chiefly responsible for building San Francisco into the West's largest city. Well, by the end of 1864, the bank would have branches in Virginia City and Gold Hill, both run by your favorite man, William Sharon. The Gold Hill branch had been the same branch, same bank, I mean, that Dwayne Bliss had once co-owned. And he stayed on with the Bank of California in an executive position uh, when they bought his bank. Now, the Bank of California's Comstock activities were actually owned and operated, as you folks all know here, 
by a small group of William Ralston's friends and associates, the group known as the Bank Ring. Dwayne Bliss was a trusted lieutenant, much like Henry Yarrington was a trusted lieutenant of the Bank Ring, but neither man ever had the money or the clout to become members of the Bank Ring. They were employees just like everyone else, but they were kind of the, the employees up at the top of the whole thing. Uh, okay, there's a Spanish word, barasca, that translated to exhausted mind, and that's what occurred in the Comstock in the mid to late 1860s. Silver output dropped by a half to seven and a half million, and most mine owners believed the end had arrived, that barasca had set in. Well, through good fortune, good timing, and a number of underhanded shenanigans, the bank ring ended up taking control of all of the remaining important mines and mills on the Comstock through foreclosure. William Ralston and William Sharon were confident there was more gold and silver in the ground, and of course they turned out to be right. The thick vein hadn't disappeared, it had just plunged deeper into the ground. And there was still enough there to make millionaires of many men. This doesn't really fit in here at all, but I like that picture because when I look at it, I feel so claustrophobic. Just looking at how they were lower raising and lowering people in, into the ground and or up from the ground. I, I, you know, I just get a shaky feeling just looking at that and imagining going 3,000 feet underground in that thing. Um, the bank ring, of course, also owned the Virginia City Water Company that was crucial to the mining effort. Uh, and they owned almost every other phase of, of uh, the Comstock operation. And today we call it a monopoly. Back then they called it a combine. Well, there was one thing, of course, that they did not control at that time and that was transportation. It required hundreds of mules and oxen and a large number of teamsters to laboriously um, haul the raw ore down the mountainside from the mines and to haul tons and tons of supplies and, and cordwood and everything back up to Virginia to fuel the steam engines, the donkey engines, the pumps, the blowers, and the other uh, expensive equipment. So, Transportation costs were huge and they were unmanageable. And that's when William Ralston and William Sharon decided, of course, to build their own railroad. And here we are. Uh, the VNT, here we see engine number four uh, pulling the train across many of, one of the many ravines that had to be built. Well, two men, Henry Harrington and Dwayne Bliss, were hired by the bank ring in 1867 to oversee the building of the railroad. Uh, Bliss had, been, had left the company by this time and gone into the stock business. Now, I'm not talking about stocks and bonds. I'm talking about stocks and cows, that, that kind of thing. Uh, he'd been under a lot of pressure, I guess, and he said he needed a break from it. So he had spent a couple of years in the stock business. And when they decided to build the VNT, they called him and asked him to come back, and they uh, put uh, he and uh, and Yarrington originally in charge of the operation. Um, Bliss was put in charge originally of construction at the Virginia end of the operation, and Yarrington in charge of the Carson City end. Now again, neither man was a member of the bank ring. Uh, Yarrington, of course, would end up as the top man uh, for the railroad. But Bliss would end up as the top man in the other vital industry the bank ring uh, needed, which was lumbering. <clears throat> Carson City, the state capital, of course, was selected for the headquarters. And here we see the BNT maintenance yard. Wasn't much of a town in the early days. Here we see Second and Carson Street in the 1870s. And here's King Street. And this is a photo that snuck in somehow because this is from the 1940s. So just pretend you didn't see this one. Well, the VNT from Virginia City to Carson City, of course, was, was completed in January 1870. And two and a half years later, the Carson City Reno leg was finished. The entire project, of course, cost 
4.9 million for the entire 52.2 mile railroad. And in addition to solving the Comstock's transportation problems, the little V&T would go on to become the most storied, profitable, and romanticized short line railroad in US history, which brings you all here every year, I would imagine. During the V&T's construction, overall management of the railroad, as I say, was turned over to Yarrington. Although Bliss maintained positions as Yarrington's assistant when he was out, as paymaster, and later as general supply agent for the railroad. He was also appointed to the V&T Board of Directors in 1871 and served in that capacity until 1900. Now, Bliss was not a big believer in the VNT for reasons that I, I was never able to understand why. He never owned more than, uh, Stephen, what was it, one share of stock is all he ever owned in it. Um, and, and that probably just to qualify him to be on the board of directors. So, uh, you know, that uh, Yarrington invested a little, you know, a little more significantly in it, but, but Bliss didn't, for some reason or other, didn't see it. But he worked for it, and he took the bank ring's money to do his job. Um, he was then asked to take on another another task for him. There we go. He was dispatched back to Carson City to handle all the arrangements for devising a system for receiving and storing lumber, timbers, cordwood uh, for shipment by the VNT back up the mountain to the Comstock. The result, of course, was this massive wood yard, you see, where they stored millions and millions of board feet of lumber and cordwood there. Um, of course, the lumber yard today is the site of the Nevada State Railroad Museum. In the early 1880s, the bank ring tried to duplicate their b and Railroad success uh, by establishing the Carson and Colorado Railroad. But as you all know, it really never succeeded too well. Yarrington ran that railroad as well, but Bliss was the vice president and a member of the board until 1900 when the railroad was finally sold off to the Southern Pacific. So I think it's time now to get to why there was so much heavy-duty timber was required in the cotton stock. And I'm going to go over this kind of quickly because I think it's a, it's a subject you're all familiar with. Here we have a cutout, a cutout view of one of the underground mines with the Didesheimer system that became very, very famous and is used throughout the world, of course, to support the underground mines. Before that, the system that was in place um, just did not carry the heavy overload in the, in the Comstock, and people were beginning to get injured, of course. Um, it said that it said that Dottesheimer first got this idea from a hornet's nest he saw inside one of the one of the mines. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But um, that's what we're looking at is the Dottesheimer system, and this is a very, very, you know, well-known photo I know to all of you folks. Um, well, this I always think of this square set system kind of like a bunch of toddlers' blocks. You put them up in any in any direction, any height, any width, any way you want to, you just put these little blocks together and it serves the, it serves the purpose. Um, one Comstock historian called it a gigantic wooden skyscraper plunging into the earth, and that truly was what it was. <clears throat> With the completion of the railroad, the bank ring had one more step to take to complete their total monopoly over the Comstock, and that was lumbering. Um, where did all that lumber and timber come from that we've been discussing? Well, the bank ring had contracts with another a number of independent loggers. Um, in the Carson and Washoe Valleys, but by the early 1870s, those forests had been completely denuded of, of usable trees. And they had begun to go further afield and nearly strip the eastern slope of the Carson Range. It was obvious the next step, of course, was going to involve moving over the eastern range of the Carson uh, to the western side into those magnificent forests of the Lake Tahoe Basin. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Once again, uh, Ralston Sharon, 
turn to Dwayne Bliss and Henry Yarrington to solve this problem for him as well. And the Carson and Tahoe Lumber and Fluming Company, I'm going to call it Carson Tahoe Lumber, was incorporated in 1870. Now, Yarrington still had a full-time job running the B&T, so he was primarily a silent partner in the Carson Tahoe. The firm was owned in almost equal parts by Bliss, Yarrington, and Darius Ogden Mills, who of course was part of the bank ring and was the money behind, the financier behind some of the early uh, acquisitions that they had to make uh, of land, lumbering land. Um, Bliss owned always from the get-go a little more stock than either of the other two men and he always had the title of president and general manager of the company, and he ran the entire operation. Yarrington, well, well yeah, just as Yarrington was running uh, the B&T operation. Bliss purchased the firm's first timberlands in the mid-1870s along the eastern slope of the Clark Carson Range along Clear Creek, 13 and a half mile long stream that begins at an altitude of 8,800 feet above the Carson River, or Carson City, and drains into the Carson River. Uh, soon after that, he made a key purchase when he bought five and a half acres of Lake Tahoe Lakeshore and Meadowland property in Glenbrook from uh, Captain Augustus Prey, who was the earliest pioneer settler there. The purchase included Prey's sawmill, which we see at work in this photo, and Glenbrook would eventually become the uh, nucleus of the Carson Tahoe Lumber's massive Tahoe uh, lumbering empire. Uh, he eventually added two more sawmills in Glenbrook, and they had three going at one time, and I think that's what we're looking at here. At its peak, Carson Tahoe Lumber would own between 50,000 and 80,000 acres of timberland in and around the Tahoe Basin. This is a summit camp above Glenbrook, one of dozens of lumbering camps that were set up uh, around the Tahoe Basin. Uh, these portable camps were really like small communities where the men could work and live, although not very comfortably, uh, for a few months at a time. Now the lumbering, of course, was occurring on both the western or Nevada side of the Carson Range and across on the eastern side, the California side. But the majority of the lumbering was really done on the Nevada side of the lake. Well, here we see a flume. At this point, I'm not going to explain what a flume is, but to my other audiences, I usually have to. But I'll throw another little surprise and kind of cute story I'll tell you about. Here's the flume as it runs all the way down the mountainside. When I put on this presentation in Virginia City, Everyone got looking at it. We had to stop where they all were having these discussions on where exactly that was. So, you know, they're trying to place this. Where, where is this? And I let the conversation go on for about five minutes. And I finally told them the truth. I said, look, when I was gathering my photos together, I wanted a picture of, you know, of a flume that still existed that went all the way down the, uh, you know, all the way down the mountains. And I finally found one. But it's in Oregon. <laughs> So this, this picture is, I don't even remember where, it's somewhere in Oregon, but it, it, did, uh, it, it did fool most of the people. <laughs> they were sure it had to be somewhere in Tahoe. It didn't look like Well, at its height, at its height in the 1870s and 80s, Carson Tahoe Lumber employed between 3,500 and 4,000 workers during the eight-month lumbering season. Obviously, they didn't, uh, you know, work in uh, in the winter time. I compared average earnings of the lumbering people with the miners and with the millers, the three industries that worked. The, the 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 wages were pretty much in the same ballpark for all three for all three categories of workers. Now here we see the Lake Tahoe Railroad, one of four. Count them four narrow gauge railroads that Bliss built to carry on Tahoe Lumber's, um, uh, Carson Tahoe's lumbering trade. Um, 
his experiences with these railroads, the one he would later build at his Lake Tahoe tourism enterprise, and of course his experience with the V&T and then Carson in Colorado, truly made him one of the most knowledgeable railroad men in the West in the early years of railroading here. Of course, the very first locomotive that he purchased for his lumbering railroads was the Glenbrook. And we all know what has become of the Glenbrook now. It's just, just magnificent to go down and visit that, uh, and visit that locomotive down at the, uh, at the Railroad Museum. Well, by 1873, of course, everything changed in the Comstock. Uh, Bill Sharon and his bank ring monopoly were forced out and replaced by another monopoly. Isn't that the way it works? Uh, the Bonanza Kings that used the same stock manipulation scheme as the bank, uh, bank ring had originally used to get in. This was supposed to have been a picture of John Mackey and his family, but as you folks will probably recognize, that's really Clarence Mackey and his family. Uh, in one of my presentations, I pronounced it to be John Mackey, and a hand went up and he said, no, sir, you're mistaken. That's his son, Clarence Mackey. So uh, there's a second, gener second generation Mackey instead. But of course, the, the new Bonanza was made up of Mackey and uh, Jim Fair, William O'Brien and James Flood, and uh, they got quite wealthy over this, and they followed the Comstock load deeper than anyone else ever had, finally created their own monopoly. Well, what survived this takeover were both the B&T Railroad and the Carson Tahoe Lumbering Company. Both would go on untouched by this change. Uh, uh, for, quite a, for quite a while, uh, the, the uh, Bonanza Kings set up their own lumbering enterprise, but they weren't able to get much prime property because it was already held by Carson Tahoe and some of the other smaller lumbering kinds. And so eventually, they, um, they worked a deal where for favorable prices, of course, they would get their lumber from Carson Tahoe, just as had been done before. Uh, there was a fire, and I don't remember the, word, uh, the, the date because this isn't, is in my presentation, but I'm sure you guys are aware of it, where uh, it is suspected that some of the other uh, some of the other mines set fire to the, the lumber yard in Carson City, the storage yard in Carson City, because they were giving favorable rates uh, to some of the other mines. I can't remember the year of that. It is, the whole story is in the book, but um, but it was interesting that both of those two, the B&T and Carson Tahoe Lumbering, did survive this changeover. Both Bliss and Yarrington got very, very wealthy in this process, too. Um, this is the house Bliss built in Carson City in 1877 for his growing family. It was the largest house in Nevada at the time it was built, some 8,000 square feet. It was one of the grandest homes in the West. Now, part of it still exists, of course, as the Bliss Mansion, uh, right around the corner from the Governor's Mansion. Um, the second part of it is somewhere down the street a little bit, and they call that the Bliss Mansion, too. So, uh, take your choice. Well, by 1880, the glory days of the Comstock were over, although there'd be a few weak revivals and everything. Uh, by the time it was over, the Comstock had given up an estimated $306 million in riches. Um, people who don't know so much about the Comstock, of course, think that was all silver. But as, as you folks probably know, 43% of it was actually gold. But what's overlooked often in this is that there was another $100 million in lumber that was taken from the surrounding hillside. So it was a third as big as the Comstock in terms of revenue produced. It's been estimated that between 400 and 500 million board feet of lumber were taken from the Tahoe Basin during the Comstock era. Now, you know, this is where for one group particularly, the Sierra Club, I had to put something in here <laughs> defending uh, Dwayne Bliss's activities in the, uh, 
you know, in, in the, the Tahoe Basin over those years. Um, it had to do with the fact that ever since the Mayflower in 1620, uh, the conquest of the wilderness was considered God's plan for man. And that was still the case when all of this lumbering was being done on the, you know, on the Comstock load. So uh, it was before we were worried, really worried about the forests and that kind of thing. It wasn't until John Muir came along uh, visiting Tahoe in 1873 and 75 that really the, you know, the modern day um, environmentalism began. And as a matter of fact, Bliss kind of changed his mind about this whole thing as he went into his next phase of his business, which was the tourism business, and uh, decided that the trees should stay now. Now, whether this was self-serving, because he knew that the tourism business in Tahoe wouldn't do too well if it, was, if it was naked of trees, or whether it was genuine, I tried very, very hard to make a personal decision to, to which way I thought Bliss might have gone on that. I couldn't decide it. So I, I present both sides of the story, and I let the reader decide for himself, you know, if, if Bliss really was a genuine environmentalist, as he said he was, or if it was just a business decision. Um, he was a very moral man, so my guess was probably that he meant what he was, what he was saying. Um, I don't really think it placated the Sierra Club. They still looked at me with awfully strange looks, you know, but it, it got me out alive anyway, so. Uh, okay, Bliss, this is the, entering into his fourth career. He really didn't invent tourism in Lake Tahoe. The Lakeshore House, which is seen here in 1866, and the Glenbrook House, both in Glenbrook, had been hosting guests since 1863. So uh, there were a few other rustic hostelries around the lake uh, as well. But Bliss did indeed perfect it. Uh, when he saw the handwriting on the wall for um, Carson Tahoe Lumber, he wanted to build another business and bring his family into it. So in 1895, he incorporated the Lake Tahoe Transportation Company, which was 100% family owned and headquartered in Glenbrook. Uh, when Carson Tahoe Lumber closed down in 1898, the three owners and later their estates, that would be Blish Yarrington and Darius Ogden Mills, would still own massive tracts of Lake Tahoe Basin land, buildings, ships, and railroads. Some of those belonged to Bliss, and he traded with the other men or their estates to get what he needed for this new tourism industry that he had in mind. Uh, among the assets that he ended up with was 100% of the land and lakeshore in and around Glenbrook. That wasn't a bad thing to come out of this with. 100% of Glenbrook was, of course, initially in the, in the, uh, uh, in his family, in the Bliss family. But the next step was to build the grandest ship on Lake Tahoe, and the result of that was the magnificent SS Tahoe that we see here. She was 169 feet long, stabilizers to prevent roll in heavy seas, and had a capacity of 200 passengers and a top speed of 18 knots. There was an exclusive ladies' cabin, a gentleman's smoking lounge, a main salon, a dining room, and on-deck seating. There was also abundant cargo space and a modern system of electric lights and bells, and the appointments were absolutely exquisite in it. She soon became recognized as the queen of the lake. In 1898, Bliss incorporated the Lake Tahoe Railway Company, as opposed to the Lake Tahoe Railroad Company, which he had built for Carson Tahoe Lumber. The Lake Tahoe Railway Company was to build a narrow gauge railroad from Tahoe City, where he was going to build his, his lodge, to Truckee, where it would connect with the Transcontinental Railroad, and open Lake Tahoe to tourists and vacationers from around the West and from indeed around the world. Here we see the train depot at Truckee. The railroad was completed in 1900 and would operate only during the tourist season from mid-May to mid-November. 
And Bliss's next step was to build a grand hotel to house all these tourists. And this was the magnificent Tahoe Tavern. Uh, the hotel was completed in Tahoe City on the California side of the lake in 1902, and it was fabulous. Uh, burned down in the 1960s, uh, which was before I came out west, so I never got to see it. How many of you ever stayed at the Tahoe Tavern? Anyone here? I stayed there, but I saw it. Okay, saw it, yeah. I guess it was really, it was really something. Um, I'm not going to read you the description of it there. That, let's see. Oh, here we go. Here we see uh, Dotso Lali, of course, the, the basket maker whose who's basket now will fetch a million dollars if you could find one of the thrift shops somewhere. She used to sit out on the front lawn in front of the lake in front of, and, and in front of the Tahoe Tavern and weave her, weave her baskets. So, Lord help us if any one of us could ever find one of those. Um, before we finish our story, we have to go back for a moment to where the lumbering all began, to Glenbrook. By 1906, two of Duane's sons, Walter and Duane Jr., were accomplishing in Glenbrook what his dad had accomplished in Tahoe City, that is turning the 19th century lumbering village into a refined resort for tourists. Uh, this is the Glenbrook Inn. It does not look nearly as grand in the photo as, as I'm told it really was. Um, but Dwayne Bliss died a happy man in 1907, the year after this portrait was taken. His family had accomplished everything that he had wanted during his lifetime, and his name lives on through the gorgeous D.L. Bliss State Park, of course, which his children donated a vast amount of the land there in their father's name uh, near Emerald Bay. Um, the last chapter dealt with how the Bliss family dealt with the legacy of their father, including the massive Tahoe Basin land that they inherited. Now, you wouldn't think that'd be much problem, you know? How do you, how do you deal with owning all of Glenbrook? Well, uh, down through the years, because of inheritance taxes, growing property taxes, and all of those sorts of things, little by little, uh, you know, the, the family had to sell off the land. Um, today, Bill Bliss, who is a, a good friend of mine and just a wonderful man, he's 92 years old, and Bill has a summer home in Glenbrook, and he winters here in Carson. And um, Bill said they have two and he has two and a half acres left in Glenbrook, including some, some waterfront land and two houses. And um, he's just as happy as can be to have that much left, you know. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. One of only two ancestors left of the Blisses. There's a, uh, a, a great granddaughter who lived in Tahoe up until just a couple of years ago, and she she moved back east, back to, the, back to the family home in Massachusetts again. But uh, Bill is very, very proud of his heritage. He very much got behind me in writing this book and everything because he knew almost nothing about his great-grandfather. He knew only what he had read in the one book that, as I told you, was all, was all incorrect. So he, he was behind me 100%. God, I hope he remembered me in his will at two and a half acres. <laughs> We'd have to be at tea conference there, you know, if I get, if I get lucky. Um, okay, um, that's about it. I think we have a couple of minutes for questioning. I, I, as I said, I kind of went quickly through that so we didn't dwell on the part that would, that would bore you folks silly. I do have a couple dozen of the Bliss biographies that I brought with me, which I'll be selling. They're 20 bucks after we're done here. And I think I'll just sit over right in this corner in that gentleman's lap right there, maybe. And, uh, you know, and if any of you would like to get a copy, you know, of the book, and of course I'll sign it, I'll be happy to do that. Um, I want to speak for just a second about my new book that's come out. It's called The Genesis of Reno, The History.
history of the Riverside Hotel on the Virginia Street Bridge. Well, little Reno history. Uh, in 1860, the first occupied sites in what would become Reno were an inn and a bridge, right? The same place the inn and the bridge are today. Um, each, each structure, the inn and the bridge, in it, is in its, well, truly the, the bridge is in its sixth iteration after the brand new bridge was just, was just opened last year. And the uh, Riverside Artist Lofts is in its fifth, fifth iteration. And it occurred to me that if you try to tell the story of the city through its two oldest sites and weave all of that together, it might make an interesting telling. And um, I, I think it did. There was a, there was a, uh, a review in Nevada and the West, just a wonderful, wonderful publication, I think, which is unfortunately ceasing publication after this issue. Uh, but there was uh, a review of my book in there, and 20-year uh, journalist Guy Clifton, who did the review, said the genesis of Reno is a tremendous story. So I'm not selling that one today, but anyone thinks that might be interested, I'll give you one of these cards. And other than that, do we have any questions? Good. Thank you very much.